Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from Cool Cleveland, and we are here actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We're here at the Bob Dylan Center with Steve Jenkins, the director of the Bob Dylan Center. Steve, thanks so much for taking time. Thomas, it's a pleasure. <laughs> you know, the first obvious question here is, why Tulsa uh, for the Bob Dylan Center? I, I have a feeling George Kaiser might have uh, something to do with it. Definitely plays a part. So you mentioned George Kaiser. He is a philanthropy powerhouse here in Tulsa who has just done so much good for the city in early childhood education, in wonderful parks such as, such as the Gathering Place, and in civic enhancement. And I would say under that category goes things like the Woody Guthrie Center, uh, which was opened nearly 10 years ago, which uh, houses the Woody Guthrie Archive. It's right here on the same block as now the newly opened Bob Dylan Center. Uh, and so Mr. Kaiser was able to acquire Dylan's archives, but Dylan really had, you know, the whole world uh, in front of him as to where he might want this to happen. Hibbing, Minnesota, perhaps, where he grew up. Uh, the folks in Hibbing, I think, wished that that had been the case. Uh, maybe New York, maybe LA, places where Dylan spends a lot of time. However, it was Tulsa that he landed on. He liked the vibe of the city. He likes the fact that we're on Native American land. Mm -hmm. I think the fact that we do the same organization runs the Woody Guthrie Center, of course, Guthrie being perhaps Dylan's formative influence, uh, and, and just liking what he calls the hum of the heartland. Uh, which he recently commented on, all made Tulsa his pick. And so it's uh, our great good fortune that we're here to steward the material. We have that hum of the heartland in Cleveland as well at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which would have been another great place for Certainly. it, unfortunately. Yes. So there were these rumors of this treasure trove of songs and lyrics and unreleased material and videos. Is that what ha ended up happening with these archives? Sure enough, you know, Dylan, for as much as he gives us through his art and through his music, obviously famously private, and you know, no one really knows what he's up to when he's not on stage or in the recording studio. But sure enough, for decades, I mean, we're talking nearly 60 years, he had been holding on to things so fortunately that uh, he decided not to toss them away. So when the archives came our way, we're talking roughly 100,000 items. Uh, this is quite extraordinary uh, for a living artist uh, to now be uh, memorialized, uh, you know, prior <laughs> to his demise, uh, hopefully by many, many, many years with this collection. And so we have, as you mentioned, handwritten lyrics, rare recordings, uh, film footage, home movies, tens of thousands of photos no one had ever seen before, musical instruments, ephemera, uh, Otis Redding's business card in Dylan's wallet, to name one of, you know, hundreds that I could uh, right. uh, tick off. But so many materials here that I think crucially help us get further into Dylan's creative process. Right. That's what we're most interested in right. here. How has this extraordinary artist maintained a level of quality, not to mention quantity, being very prolific, for so long, what has he brought to the craft of songwriting, recording, singing, performing, uh, adopting various persona? How has this all come together? And I do think that these materials in the archive give us a look into that creative process in a way that we've not had before. You know, there must have been some surprises when you started opening those boxes. We've talked to Clinton Halen, who's maybe the biggest biographer of Dylan. And he, of course, his mind exploded, I think, when he realized. But what were the surprises you found that really no one kind of thought would be included here? Well, there were some pieces that were rumored to exist or perhaps wished by the hardcore Dylanologists around the world, uh, uh, particularly what's known as the blood notebooks. So um, these are the notebooks in which Dylan was writing and crafting and rewriting and grappling with the songs that make up the incredible 1975 Blood on the Tracks album. Uh, just one masterpiece after another, Simple Twist of Fate, uh, Lily Rosemary and the Jack of Hearts, etc. Uh, Tangled Up in Blue. Uh, so we knew one notebook existed. It had ended up in the collection of the Morgan Library in New York under somewhat uncertain provenance. Let's just say Dylan said someone took it at some point. Um, so this one notebook existed, but it, it contains nearly final versions of the songs on Blood on the Tracks. So 
many of us thought there's got to be more because uh, we knew a bit about his songwriting process, enough to know that there were probably earlier versions. Sure enough, the archives arrive in Tulsa, boxes are opened. Mark Davidson, who serves as our director and curator of archives, has you know one aha, unbelievable moment after another. And sure enough, there are these two other notebooks. So now they form a trilogy. Uh, and we had the third, uh, the, the known notebook um, on loan until quite recently here. So for the first time since 1974-75, we believe, these notebooks were united. And uh, as visitors, you can really, um, through, through the notebooks being um, uh, displayed and also through what I think is quite a clever projection of the flipping pages of the notebook and the way in which these phrases and lyrics were changing and adopting and, and coming toward their final version, uh, you have a, a real sense of what went into the Blood on the Tracks album. So there's quite a bit like that, uh, that yes, took us by surprise or confirmed rumors of what might have been existing. Uh, and it's our job to put this work within contexts that, again, touch on the creative uh, process and if we're doing our job right, I think showing Dylan in, in all his multifaceted yeah. glory. You know, this is a particularly complex artist uh, who can write on matters of the heart, matters of politics, often within the same phrase, uh, and, uh, and also has a, a keen humor uh, for as serious as we all take him, I think. So we're trying to get at Dylan from all these different angles without ever pretending that there's any one right version. You know, all of our interpretations are legitimate. I like that you say you're not really trying to answer the questions, but you're really trying to raise more questions. That's a good thing to do, I think, with, a, with an archive like this. So there's the surprises, and then there's your own personal favorites. You came here from mm. San Francisco. I did. Um, but when you personally look around, I, I do this with certain museums where I'm like, I always end up going to certain <laughs> exhibits. What really tickled your fancy when you started to look at it? Well, there's so much here. You know, I'm a lifelong Dylan fan in addition to having the professional bona fides to be part of this team. And so merging those two things, the personal and the professional, and being surrounded by this material day in, day out is really quite a treat. Uh, I go again and again to the display that we have on most of the time. Uh, one of my favorite Dylan songs, this is from 1989 on the Oh Mercy album. And we have never before heard uh, studio recordings, not only of different versions of the song, but of Dylan and his fellow musicians. And this was in New Orleans, Daniel Lenoir was producing. You had the Neville brothers, you had other incredible musicians coming together in this old house in New Orleans to cut this album. You hear the studio chatter, you hear Dylan himself saying, no, it's not working. You know, for somehow for Dylan, to, to hearing him admit, you know what, I, I've hit a dead end, or we need to do something different, or this chord sequence isn't working. I find heartening uh, just to know that he's working at it as hard and as uh, uh, conscientiously and diligently as you know any other great artist does. Uh, so that most of the time sequence that we have in the church studio control room, uh, where you can really get deep into the recording of that song, I find very fascinating. Um, I love to see correspondence. So we've got a wonderful letter from Johnny Cash uh, to Dylan filled with wordplay and um, shows a lighter side of Cash and also suggests what sort of friendship and mutual admiration society the two of them had. Uh, there, there's so much. I think it's fascinating to look at uh, the so-called born again years uh, and the trilogy of albums, Slow Train Coming, uh, saved and shot of love. You know, I think the music on those albums was overlooked at the time because everyone was so up in arms over Dylan embracing seemingly the most, you know, uh, mainstream uh, uh, belief system and being some vocal about it. Uh, that I think at, at the time a lot of the music itself was missed. So I think it's terrific to go back and listen to some of those tracks. Yeah, you mentioned Daniel Lanois, and uh, he, he spends a third of his autobiography on his work with Daniel Lanois. I went back and counted the pages. Yes. Because I remarked that every time I turned, it's like, he's talking about this again. So that was probably as important to Dylan as it was to you, it sounds like. Well, I think Oh Mercy was a key record for him because it was toward the end of the 80s and he had struggled a bit, you know, through the 80s, um, whether with production styles on something like Empire Burlesque, which, uh, you know, has wonderful songs as the albums always do, but 
sounds a little trapped in its time period, uh, if you will. Uh, then there were some stripped back, back to basics records. You know, he was trying to figure out what is a Bob Dylan record sound like right now. And Lanois really, I think, helped him uh, find a new sound and a new groove. Uh, you know, the two of them uh, worked together again eight years later on the incredible Time Out of Mind record. Uh, we have a whole section on the song Not Dark Yet. Uh, which I think is really worth delving deep into. Um, so yes, an, a, an important professional uh, working relationship there. Talk about Dylan's legacy. Uh, it's hard to do because he, he's influenced so many areas. Uh, poetry, he's won awards <laughs> for- Nobel Prize for Nobel literature. For literature, mm -hmm. he's won Grammys for music. Um, he's, he's, he's influenced so many people in so many ways. What do you think when we, at the end of the day, we're going to look at Bob Dylan and, and, and is going to remain? Uh, obviously, the songs will remain. What about his, his influence, his impact? I think it's the approach. And if it can be summed up at all, which is a fool's errand to even try, to me, there's something about fearless creativity. Just pursuing, uh, you know, I'll often say the muse. I don't know if this is a term that Dylan himself uses, but we can use it as a shorthand for something that's there that he is just pursuing without worrying about uh, audience too much, it would seem. Uh, you know, sometimes alienating his audiences. So be it. This is where his creativity takes him. I, I mentioned those, those, you know, the Born Again trilogy. Uh, this was confounding to a lot of long time uh, Dylan uh, listeners and followers, but that's what worked for, for Dylan at the time, you know, I suppose personally, as well as uh, in his artistic output. So, you know, from there to today, I mean, we're, we're meeting on a day where he's kicking off a European tour. Uh, I believe he's in uh, Norway uh, tonight, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for a whole series of dates across Europe. 81 years old, still playing about 80 shows a year, uh, and always looking ahead. You know, this is the other thing related to this fearless creativity is, despite the fact that he kept so much, which we're so thankful for, he really has espoused that don't look back philosophy. You know, I'm uh, borrowing the name of Pennebaker's film from uh, 1965, which caught Dylan in the throes of fame on that UK tour. Uh, and I think he seemed to realize back then, boy, this could be a trap. You know, fame can really mess with you. Um, believing your own legends can mess with you. Believing everyone's projections onto you uh, can be confounding. And so he seemed to, all then and now, sidestep any preconceived notions of what Bob Dylan, who Bob Dylan is supposed to be. And he just continues to do his own thing. We have this remarkable record two years ago now, Rough and Rowdy Ways. Uh, we had that uh, Shadow Kingdom broadcast last year, uh, uh, you know, refiguring old songs in this wonderful sort of noirish, um, you know, beautifully shot black and white uh, broadcast. Uh, you know, he, he released Murder Most Foul in the midst of the COVID lockdown without any warning and very little fanfare. Suddenly we're all listening to the 17 minute song and once again, pouring over lyrics, trying to figure out all the illusions, literary, cultural, biblical, whatever it might be. Uh, we will always be chasing after him. And so when we talk about legacy, yes, I mean, we can imagine that like we're doing with Shakespeare's works, uh, subsequent generations will be studying Dylan lyrics and listening to these recordings. Uh, but there's something at the core that is undefinable. Um, he's held on to this mystique. Somehow all of this, I think, combines to form this fascinating figure that, uh, that will outlast us all uh, and, uh, you know, bring joy and uh, confusion <laughs> and humor and solace and all the rest of it to uh, as long as people are listening to music. He really does confound our expectations. And the minute you say something about him, he goes in another direction. Absolutely. Anyone that's seen him live probably comes away a little confused, some angry, <laughs> because he refuses to do these songs this, the way you've heard them, the way you love them. Sure. But that's him. He's always worked for himself, 
and that's really worked out well for him. It's worked out well for us as well. I think so. And and what that asks from from us as listeners and followers is is to bring our own experience to bear, and not merely um, sort of passively take in what we're being given, but grapple with that work the way that Don himself seems to. You know, what does it mean to uh, do a song like? Uh, most likely you'll go your way and I'll go mine in 2022. It's currently on his set list, you know, from decades ago. Uh, what's changed since then? What hasn't? Uh, why call for a new musical arrangement? Uh, we could say the same for Got to Serve Somebody, which he's been doing on this tour. And it might take you a moment in concert to realize, wait, it's Got to Serve Somebody. I love this song. But of course, you're getting a different rhythm, a different cadence, a different energy, a different meaning. Uh, so despite me saying that Dylan doesn't look back, he will revisit yeah. uh, songs from this enormous songbook of 500 plus songs, but almost always um, to retool them somehow and to bring something new to them. Um, he's reflecting where he's at at different points in his life. And we as listeners can reflect on where we are in our own journeys, our own paths, how we intersect with Dylan uh, and you know, for me, just be thankful that uh, these years have overlapped and uh, we get to be around when he is. That's true. Yeah, I remember seeing him in concert and uh, it, I, unintelligible, had no idea the arrangement. And then you hear, take up in blue. <laughs> and you're like, oh, OK. Yes. And then for him to also do other so covers. I mean, he spent three albums recently covering songs. Uh, the greatest American songwriter acknowledged of all time is now not just a couple songs, no, <laughs> a triple album, a trip, yep, five, five records all together, albums mm -hmm. covering uh, the songbook of Frank Sinatra, essentially. Sure. Yes, and I found myself it was a favorite of my father's. For example, mm -hmm. I heard those songs sung by my father walking around the house. I never knew what they meant until I heard the Dylan interpretation. Mm. It's so strange to me mm -hmm. to hear Dylan, and I was going. Oh my God, that's what this song is. And, and it changed my, my view of my family. Mm. It was so profound. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so happy to be speaking with you here, Steve. We could talk for, for a long, long time. It, it, it's such a joy to hear your understanding, your interpretation, your passion for this. And I, I'm so pleased to be here in Tulsa, Oklahoma with you right now. Thomas, you so, so happy you're here. It's a pleasure to chat to a fellow Dylan enthusiast. Thank you. And, uh, you know, what I said is just that. It's my take on this. Uh, and while I have, I, I am a hardcore Dylanologist, uh, it doesn't mean that everyone who walks through the door doesn't have their own interpretations, yeah. which uh, uh, can be brought to bear on this material. Uh, so we are open to all visitors, uh, to all analysis, to all levels of uh, interpretation and joy and all the rest of it. Uh, so thanks so much for your interest. Thank you so much. Thanks for your hospitality. My pleasure. Hey, it's Thomas Mulready from Cool Cleveland. Have a great week in Cool Cleveland.